Good morning, everyone. Hey, How's it going, Tyler? Langer. Good morning. Um, one question. Go for it. One question about my moon project. Um, oh, my God. <laughs> is, it, it said for the location. Do you want us to give you the location? Yeah, it's just mainly uh, like the city would be fine. Like, I, I wanted y'all to make a note if you happen to be traveling around or anything like that, because, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting for y'all to see that, yeah, we get the same moon phase. Uh, yeah. No where we are. Yeah, just checking before I post the photos and put the photos in the in uh, for PDF. Okay, yeah. that's all I need. No problem. Anyone else have any cool questions? All right, I'm gonna wait for the rest of you people to straggle in. I'm trying to look at where all we are. Oh, you guys are definitely due for a test. Of course, you just finished one on chapter seven and eight. Uh, so our chapter nine and 10 tests should be coming next. Let me see if I got a practice test for that yet. Uh, appear not to. I'll be making a practice uh, test for test five, which covers chapters nine and 10. I'll be making that probably today or tomorrow and post it tonight or tomorrow night. And I'll send you an email when it actually happens. I do not appear to have one. Oh yeah, I do have one. That'll work. Yeah, that works fine. Okay, so I do have one. So I'll go ahead and put that practice test up now. That will be nice. Anybody have any other questions while we're waiting for more people to come in? Oh, wait, I did hear something on the news that they're thinking about doing a um, space competition, like one of those. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I heard this morning and they're thinking about sending sexy people up into space, <laughs> even though we already have a lot of sexy people who've already been to space. Like <laughs> Ridley. <laughs> we don't want our ugliest going out and representing us. <laughs> Right. <laughs> terrible oh my god uh yeah it's probably one of those things where basically some company has managed to uh secure a trip on a soyuz rocket or something like that and uh the winner they'll do some kind of game or something and the winner will get a a, a trip that'd be kind of cool but I, I do like the idea that we might actually be able to start you know seeing regular space travel even though it's for just the most elite wealthiest or you know sexiest or, or <laughs> award winningest or whatever uh, i wish they had a competition for intellectuals or something but anyways we'll, we'll go and just ignore that <laughs> that's just an unfair advantage right there yeah i mean i can't <laughs> if i entered it just be wouldn't it wouldn't be any fair i mean what, me and my missing two from my new eyeball and my extra missing hair so i guess i just they'll probably send me a letter saying i'm not allowed to enjoy to join i'm assuming that's what's going to happen <laughs> all right yes i did confirm it looks like not only do we have a quiz it actually works so uh we're golden on that so the practice uh test for test five is now up and visible on blackboard i should be canvas and it's in the practice test area, of course. So what I'm going to shoot for is uh, probably a test a week from today uh, that'll open up a week from today and you guys will have until the following Tuesday to get it done. So you might want to get cracking on that. Uh, we're actually quite a bit of a ways ahead of that. I'm probably going to go ahead and open up uh, practice test six too, which would include 11 and 12 because today we're going to cover chapter 12. So let's go ahead and get started if no one has any other questions. I'm going to share my screen and then I'm going to get aggravated that the enable uh, editing is not gone because I got it to do that earlier and it's still there and it makes me angry. It wouldn't let me when I'm angry. That's a reference to the Incredible Hulk series. 
Bill Bixby or David Banner or whatever his name was. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> this chapter is chapter 12. It's on dwarf planets and small solar system bodies. And I will start off doing, the impression, doing an impression of a good teacher by reading you the learning goals from chapter 12. And they are learning goal one, list the categories of small bodies and identify their locations in the solar system. Whew. Learning goal two, not yawn while teaching. Nope. Learning goal two, describe the defining characteristics of dwarf planets in the solar system. Learning goal three, describe the origin of the types of asteroids, comets, and meteorites. Learning goal four, explain how asteroids, comets, and meteorites, uh, or meteorites, excuse me, providing important clues about the history and formation of the solar system. And learning goal five, describe what has been learned from observations of recent impacts in the solar system. Okay, so uh, things like asteroids and comets uh, and meteors in general are all things that have a potentially really large effect uh, on us. Obviously, you've heard about the extinction of the dinosaurs, which many people think was at least precipitated by a collision uh, 65 million years ago. That is a, a very real scenario. And we do have things. We have, for instance, uh, NeoWise is a satellite we've got uh, looking all over the infrared spectrum and all over the universe, in fact, as far as it can see, but mainly where we care about the inner solar system and outer solar system area. But its job is to constantly look for objects that could ultimately run into the Earth, what we call near Earth objects and stuff like that. And it's found on the orders of, of tens of thousands of them. So we do watch out for that. But the deal is because uh, we do that because it could uh, be the end of humanity period. I mean, literally, we could go extinct because of this. So <clears throat> it's a big deal to keep an eye on such things. Uh, we have plans that NASA and scientists and engineers have worked out of ways to divert things that are on the small side. If they're on the big side, uh, there's a lot less we can do. But uh, on the order of, and, and it, depending on how much warning we get, uh, we can do a, a more things. So for instance, uh, you might think, oh, let's just shoot the darn thing if it's coming towards us. Uh, that doesn't necessarily work so well because if you shoot the darn thing as it's coming towards us, you now have one thing that's broken up into several things, uh, all of which are big enough to cause problems. And now there are dozens of them. You have no control of where they're going. Uh, you can, after watching them a little time, find out roughly where they're going to go and where they're going to hit the earth or whatever. Uh, but, you know, that's even smaller time than you had to prepare before. So one of the better options is to fly a spacecraft uh, out near the actual object and then have it put in orbit right next to it. So the slow gravitational tug, which would be quite minor on the actual comet over a long period of time would actually deflect it from the orbit it's in to a slightly different orbit. And uh, hopefully by doing that, you can make the orbit uh, a little less likely to run into the Earth. So that's one of the, the better plans, if you will. Uh, have anybody heard, of, heard about this stuff before? Oh, go ahead, Jamon. Um, I know a movie that had used that concept of shooting a um, um, an asteroid, and when it did explode, all the pieces did fall down to Earth, and it did cause some <laughs> animals to mutate. Right. It's called Love and Monsters. Really? I hadn't heard of this. Okay. Yeah, it came out, I think, late last year. Cool. And you say Love and Monsters? Yeah. That's I'm so going to cool. look it up. Now that is a, a sort of a scenario. Obviously, uh, evolution takes a lot longer time than than that would be suggestive of. But if it's spread out long enough, in principle, yeah, if you actually take something, hit the surface of the Earth, uh, it's going to cause more or less a a cloudy year, a cloudy month, a cloudy three months, a cloudy season, or like I said, maybe even beyond a cloudy year, and that's enough time for short-lived species, say things that only live on the order of weeks, uh, to actually have many generations pass by and therefore uh, uh, they could get an evolutionary advantage by some mutations. Uh, I, I suspect most animals wouldn't be able to do that, but if you uh, actually made it bad enough or maybe there was a series of them uh, that spanned over three or four years then you could actually get it. But yeah, that that's a kind of cool uh, idea to think about. I will look into that movie and see what I can find out. Uh, 
I got a chat going here. Oh yeah, love, love much. Gotcha. So I got that. All right, so let's get started on this uh, chapter 12 slide. So this is actually uh, part of the comment uh, that we actually landed on. Uh, Y'all might remember this. I think it happened in 2014. It was comment 67P, Cherry Moon off. Uh, and I'm, I apologize. Uh, my jumps at pronouncing transliteration of what I suspect might have been uh, Russian uh, words is not very good. So let me go ahead and let these people in. Yes, yeah, so the the European Space Agency landed a probe on the comet. The comet's called 67P Churyumov Gerasim Semenko. And uh, it was a little bit of a failure. Uh, I mean, it did a lot of good science both before and after in the mission getting there. Uh, and even during, they made the best out of it. But basically, the attempt was to land on this object. And then they had these cool anchoring devices where basically explosions would go off and they would lock it into place. But the problem is it landed one of the few spots it could land <sighs> where there wasn't any sunlight hitting the actual object. So the object that came down off of the, the flying craft that got it there was supposed to drill and get us all this cool data. And that would have been super friggin' awesome. But it ended up landing in an in a inopportune spot. And that spot was in the shade. So it was its whole intent was to run off of uh, solar panels. Well, the solar panels weren't in the sun. So it ended up only lasting, lasting for a couple of days on the batteries that it had. So they did as much science, uh, scientific discovery as they could. But it's still, like, like I said, it was really awesome. But it was really sad. And some poor scientists, he got all sad and cried because he... He was actually interviewed and he was wearing one of those uh, gaudy shirts with little strippers all over it and that offended a lot of people and he felt bad and everybody's like he's the nicest guy in the world he was just wearing a goofy shirt and he was crying and saying I'm, I'm sorry I love women I would never ever treat them badly and so that was another sad issue but anyways check that mission out if you want that was pretty cool uh, so we have actually landed on uh, objects, meteors is what we call them when we see them as streaks in the sky. Meteorites is what we call them uh, when they actually have hit the surface of the earth in some way or form, or some, some way or another. And meteoroids are what they are when they're in space. The meteor is just a uh, basically a streak of light in the sky. And the meteoroid is the thing that caused it. And the thing that caused it could have been an asteroid, could have been a comet, could have been smaller bodies that we don't really call asteroids or comets. And they could be made of ice, they could be made of rock, they could be made of mixtures of ice and rock and metal and all sorts of good stuff. So that's some of the questions we're gonna to answer today. What are some small, so, or what are small solar system bodies? What kinds of small bodies are there? Where are the small solar system bodies located? Uh, you've probably heard of the asteroid belt, of course. Uh, and I've mentioned a couple of times the Kuiper belt. Uh, there's also an Oort cloud that has them. And then there's just places that random where you'll find spots of them. So uh, what are dwarf planets? Where do meteorites, asteroids, and comets come from? How do we learn about the formation of the solar system? And then finally, what do <clears throat> recent impacts teach us? So here's sort of the categories. We have uh, dwarf planets. So in 2005, I want to say, this guy, let me stop share for a second. And let me share another screen, which I think will be this one right here. And <clears throat> this guy right here, Michael E. Brown, he actually appears in an episode of the Universe season uh, series, season one. But he's actually a astronomer from Caltech, and he was born just five years and two days before me, evidently. Well, turbo, actually, two days shy of five years before me. But anyways, he just discovered a planet, and of course, he you know discovered it by looking at his telescope view through his computer, sitting in his office at Caltech, and he immediately called his wife and said, hey, I just discovered a planet. And he was going to name it Xena, as in Xena, the warrior princess, which would have been really cool. But anyways, uh, he found it, and it was actually in the asteroid belt. Okay. So he immediately turned it over to the International Astronomical Union, said, hey, I thought, think I found the planet. And it turned out to be quite a bit bigger than Pluto. So it became a problem. Are we going to make this and Pluto 
a planet or are we going to demote both of them and that's when the whole fiasco about the demotion of pluto came into being uh so in some sense he is responsible for killing pluto and that's what many people do and he he's he lives he loves that he says he says yeah pluto had it coming you know so that's kind of an interesting sidebar but anyways mike brown uh did that and it was all because he found a planet uh what you thought was a planet that we ultimately named the dwarf planet and called it eris e-r-i-s and we did not get to win the cool name of xena warrior princess for that planet but anyways uh we found several of them uh basically planetesimals are still around as asteroids comets dwarfs uh dwarf planets kuiper belt objects and meteoroids the Kuiper Belt is a disc-shaped population of comet nuclei, and it goes about 30 astronomical units to 50 astronomical units. So it's pretty, you know, it's on the order of a, a light year at the outer edge. So that's that's pretty significant in terms of distance. The dwarf planet planets, and this is the, the definition that ultimately uh, caused Pluto to no longer be a planet, is that one, they have to orbit a star. Obviously, Pluto and all the planets that we know of do that. Two, they have to have been massive enough to basically have been a liquid at some point so that they could become spheres. So if they're roughly spherical, then obviously they could be a, uh, a dwarf planet, or excuse me, a planet or a dwarf planet. And then the third thing that they have to be, and this is the one that killed Pluto, is they have to be large enough to clear their orbit. So if their orbit has a lot of chunky debris that's you know, on the order of a tenth or maybe even a hundredth the size of the individual planet, uh then it hasn't cleared its orbit of debris and therefore it's not a planet and people are uh objects obeying the first two but not the third were called dwarf planets and later just to shut the public up because they were really upset about it they uh gave it the honorary name plutoids so they're also called plutoids or dwarf planets so that's what they are here's some of them you got namaka uh, which is a moon of a dwarf planet, Humea, and Hyaka, uh, which I'm doing a really bad job pronouncing, so I'm trying to pretend like I know how to pronounce it. So Hyaka is also a moon of Humea. Maki Maki, uh, I know this is actually a sort of like a Polynesian type uh, Hawaiian area of, uh, of mythology. So I'm trying to think that make make is probably like mahi mahi the, sh the fish so i apologize if i'm horribly wrong but that's why i call it maki maki <laughs> anyways eris uh was later discovered to have a, a moon its, its moon was dysnomia and that's a god of discontent okay luna y'all might know that one that's our moon uh and sharon and uh actually pluto has a couple of moons uh it has Sharon, Hydra, Nix, and I want to say there's two more because there's five. I just can't remember what the names are right now. Uh, and Cirrus. Cirrus is another one. Cirrus was one that we've known since the 1800s. It's actually in the uh, in the asteroid belt. So these are all uh, various uh, moons that exist. And you can tell a lot of them are, uh, you know, comparable in size or even in this case, in the case of air is bigger than Pluto. Yeah, I was right about Sirius. I, I just saw the comment about Sirius and I just want to make sure that my reading was, uh, my memory of my reading was correct. And there are hundreds of dwarf planet candidates. The illustration below, Luna is the moon. Uh, so that gives you some idea of what the dwarf planets are. And literally there's hundreds of them. So we're just showing you a few. Pluto actually was discovered by coincidence. They, they did the same sort of thing that, that allowed them to discover Neptune. Uh, they were basically finding that a, a orbit anomaly uh in the planet they just found which in that case was uh, uh neptune they thought they found the orbital anomaly they worked out the math and tried to find uh a planet that actually could explain the anomaly later they discovered that the anomaly was wrong they got their math wrong but while looking for that other planet uh they discovered oops there's pluto so pluto was discovered uh, in the 1900s and uh, there was a national contest to try to find who was going to name it. And a little girl won. And lo and behold, she won with the name of Pluto. And it was not, was not, was not related at all to, uh, to Disney. She, in fact, knew her mythologies and, and thought that would be a good one because of this cold, dark place that Pluto would be in.
It has five discovered moons, as I told you. Uh, the Pluto system's mass is about one four hundredth the mass of the Earth, so that gives you an idea how small it is. It has an eccentric orbit, and these are all reasons, by the way, that we ultimately uh, saw that it didn't fit in when we were doing the creation of the solar system. Uh, it has an eccentric orbit. It's tilted by a lot. It's mostly ice and gunk as opposed to rock and mineral and metal. Uh, it's geologically active activity discovered by New Horizons in 2015. It's icy surface of water, carbon dioxide, methane, and carbon monoxide. It actually has mountains made of ice, and it was kind of cool, like one of the mission uh, people uh, that were running the mission uh, to the New Horizon missions to Pluto actually published a paper about what he thought the landscape of Pluto would be. And within like 24 hour period, he was able to get observations back to conclude that his paper was right. So that's kind of cool. Uh, it has flowing nitrogen ice on the surface. So basically, you know, liquid nitrogen, that's, that's like a cool thing there because that's the temperature that it's dealing with. And of course, it's right on the cusp of where it becomes a solid. So you've got flowing water, uh, liquid nitrogen along with chunks of nitrogen around. Uh, it has a thin atmosphere of nitrogen, methane, and carbon dioxide. Uh, there's cool parts of it. I definitely recommend you go to New Horizons website and look at all the photos. But it's just so cool to think that, you know, I, I was just teaching astronomy uh, maybe 10 years ago. And the only images we have of Pluto was like a little circular box of, of squares, basically square pixels that had a goldish hue to it. And that was literally the only picture we had of Pluto. And uh, I couldn't imagine having anything like we got now, but yeah, sure enough, uh, we shot a mission to Pluto, uh, flew so close to it that we could get really good images of it. It's really freaking awesome. So here's Cirrus. Uh, this is the one that's in the asteroid belt. It actually has this really shiny thing on it that confused people for a while. Uh, we now know that it's, it's nothing that big of a deal, but it is kind of interesting that we had it. It was discovered in 1801, uh, but it was recently explored by the Dawn mission. Its properties are it's the largest object in the asteroid belt. It's about one third the mass of the asteroid belt, and the mass is only about 1.3% of the moons. So it's still way smaller than the moon, but it's the, uh, you know, as big as one third of the entire asteroid, uh, asteroid, the entire asteroid belt. Its rotation period is about nine hours. It has a large crater with landslides on its surface. It's large, inactive, salty mud cryovolcano. So like Pluto, it's got these mountains made of uh, frozen stuff, which is really what rock is anyways, but this is frozen uh, things that we would call gases, you know? So in that sense, it's kind of neat. Uh, things that we were used to as being in at least a liquid state on the earth, but in some cases, the gaseous state on earth are actually in solid form there and create these volcanoes whose pressure, motivation, stuff like that is more about temperature as opposed to uh, the inner hot surfaces of the uh, volcanoes causing magma and stuff like that. These are like magma of ice, if you will. It's lower density than the other rocky solar system bodies and there probably is water one to two meters beneath the surface. Evidently, that's a big thing that we do now in astronomy. We just assume everything has uh, water beneath the surface. No. I'm making that up. They, they don't really do that. They uh, do studies and then they discover that this is forced upon them. So, uh, but I just wanted to point out that it is kind of weird how many things have water below the surface once we first discovered that one happened, uh, happened to have it. Now we're finding like a lot of things have it. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, Eris's properties, this is the one that Mike Brown discovered. It's more massive than Pluto. Its albedo is about 0.96. That means it reflects the buttload of the light. 96% of the light that hits it bounces right back. Uh, so it, when a planet has a high uh, albedo, it generally is cold. So for instance, our Earth, when it went through that ice age that you guys got to watch about in the Earth making of a planet, when it got covered with ice, it had a really high albedo and that albedo made it stay even colder for a longer period of time because none of the, the radiation was trapped on the surface to warm it up. Instead, it was all, almost all reflected backwards. It has a pristine surface of methane ice. It's too cold for an atmosphere. Uh, it has one moon that we know of, dysnomia, and the inclination of the orbit is greater than Pluto's. I should have mentioned, by the way, Pluto is like Uranus in that its uh, orbital axis is essentially in the plane of the, uh, or excuse me, I should say it's, its rotational axis is essentially in the plane of the orbital 
so that means it's sort of like Uranus, it, it rotates like this, as opposed to like this as it orbits around. So its rotation is this. Notice how the axis isn't changing it. It's not like some magical pointer thing that points to a particular spot in space. No, it, it obeys the conservation of angular momentum. So basically its axis points in one direction and pretty much stays that direction. Uh, and that also means, of course, anything that's a natural satellite for it, like its moon, would orbit that way as well. Jumea, uh, its properties is ablate because it rotates so quickly. So you can see how this one, believe it or not, y'all might think, oh, well, that's not spherical. That shouldn't be a dwarf planet. That is spherical enough because really the, the fact is that it's an ellipsoid, uh, which meant it had to have get in a liquid state. But because it rotates so fast, it's slung that liquid state further out here for one side and actually been pulled towards the other side, if you will, if you want to think about what the sun would do to it or whatever. But it actually became more or less an oblate uh, spheroid, or in this case, an, an oblate ellipsoid. And uh, basically, that shape is due to its fast rotation, specifically when it was in the liquid state. It has two discovered moons, Namaka and Hayaka. Again, no idea of pronunciation. It's slightly larger orbit than Pluto's, so it's actually in the Kuiper belt as well. Makey Makey or Maki Maki, however we pronounce that. Anybody know, by the way? Anybody familiar with Polynesian mythology? Or And I don't even know if I'm being insensitive by calling that Polynesian or not, so I apologize if that's offensive to people, but uh, it's from the uh, ideas of the Hawaiians, let's put it that way. I really shouldn't say the Hawaiians, that's sort of what America named it, but whatever uh, culture spawned it, which I do think was Polynesian. So I guess no one knows Maki Maki. I had a student once who was from Hawaii. He told me how to pronounce it, but I forgot. I think it's Maki Maki. So one discovered moon is covered in methane, ethane, and nitrogen ices. So what about the asteroid belt? So remember we talked about the uh, Roche limit. So if you think about Jupiter, Jupiter is really big. And anything within a certain distance of Jupiter is going to try to obviously form a moon, uh, or excuse me, form a moon through gravity like it, you know, like it normally would as far as rings go and stuff like that. But the problem is if you're too close, then you're in that Roche limit and the actual North Pole of Jupiter fights against the South Pole of Jupiter to fight over two objects that are trying to gravitationally attract to one another. So if you come too close, then the forces of Jupiter win and you don't get planets. So I'm not saying the majority of the asteroid belt is within uh, uh, Jupiter's Roche limit. I'm just saying that a lot of things that come too close to Jupiter can actually be uh, torn apart and then, of course, end up back in the asteroid belt. So the asteroid belt is an attempt. Basically, it's a location that was an attempt that might have been planets, but because of various problems uh, with Jupiter and other things, uh, those things just couldn't form together as planets. So now we're left with mostly rock. And you remember the asteroid belt has the, uh, the word asteroid in it. And asteroid has the letter R in it. And rock is, starts with an R. So we generally think of asteroids as rocky, even though we found that they actually have more ice than we suspect. And we normally think of comets, which starts with the letter C, which, has the, which is the letter that's in the middle of ice. Uh, we normally think of them as icy. But of course, we've actually found many of those have a lot more rock than we expected. So the asteroids are generally found in the asteroid belt, but you can see that they actually uh, happen other places. So for instance, there's the asteroids uh, called the Trojans that are actually uh, basically things in, uh, I don't, we didn't really talk about it very much, but they're Lagrange points of an orb orbit. So they're actually floating in space, but of course they're still orbiting or else the sun would pull them in. Uh, just ahead of, just and just behind uh, Jupiter. And then there's, of course, Achilles and Sylvia and uh, Amor and I think that's Aten and Apollo and Cirrus. All those things are in orbit. Uh, and that's really what the asteroid belt looks like. Notice it isn't it's as flat and planar as, uh, well, it's about as fat, flat and planar as our solar system is. And that's the same thing with the Kuiper belt as well as the asteroid belt. They're a little thicker than just, you know, two dimensional objects. There are several gaps in the asteroid belt and that's where there's uh, orbital resonances with Jupiter. So in, for instance, in the location where Jupiter orbits once for every three orbits of the asteroid belt, 
there's this huge gap right here that basically means, uh, hey, every third time around an object at this particular location gets an extra boost pulled outward from Jupiter pulling it this way. And over hundreds and thousands and actually, in fact, uh, around 4.6 billion years, that's enough time to suck everything out of that. Same thing with the 5-2. So uh, this thing completes five orbits every time Jupiter does two. So uh, basically, it gets sucked out. This is a 7-3. This is a 2-1. So those actually cause sort of holidays, if you will, in the asteroid belt. And you don't find much stuff there. Uh, they were called the Kirkwood Gaps by a man by the name of Kirkwood who discovered them, I think, in the 1800s. Uh, the asteroid belt contains binary asteroids. So there's asteroids that orbit one another. There's asteroids that have sort of moons and stuff like that as well. We'll show you Ida and Dactyl in a second. So here's the Kirkwood Gaps that I was talking about. And you can see how uh, the obviously the semi major axis runs from about two to 3.5 for the asteroid belt. And that makes sense because Mars is 1.52 and Jupiter's right about five. So that gives you an idea roughly uh, how big the asteroid belt is. You can see the vast majority of the asteroids are, of course, between let's say 2.1 and or maybe even, yeah, 2.1 to 2.5. And then there's another big clump from 2.5 to 2.8. And then there's another uh, slightly smaller clump from 2.8 to 3, so on and so forth. Asteroids are divided by orbital characteristics. The Trojan asteroids share Jupiter's orbit, and they're held in place by Jupiter's gravitational field. I want you to remember that that phrase, held in place, is not saying that they're just sitting there, OK? they're moving along so they're always sort of the same distance ahead of Jupiter and the same distance behind Jupiter because they're moving in the same orbit and therefore have to have the same speed or else they'd be sucked in. So uh, that's what we mean by they're uh, hanging around if you will or uh, held in place if you will. So near Earth objects are asteroids whose orbits bring them within 1.3 astronomical units of the Sun. Uh, obviously you know there can be uh, objects that orbit from way out here and then come in, say, like this, that's a near-Earth object. It, it spends the vast majority of its time way, way out here, but it still came within 1.3 uh, astronomical units of the sun. And of course, one astronomical units would be out here where there's Mercury, uh, there's Venus right here on this orbit. So one would be right here, 1.3 maybe right might be right about here or even right about here. So anything that does that is a near Earth object. That that's the one that I was telling you about. Neo Wise is looking for. Uh, so it's keeping an eye out for things like that. There are there are Amar asteroids which cross the orbit of Mars but not Earth. There are Apollo asteroids that cross the orbit of Earth and Mars. And then there's Aten asteroids that cross the orbit of Earth but not Mars. So Aten from Ancient Egypt, of course, uh, it orbits uh, through Earth, but not Mars. Apollo does both of them. That's the Greek god. And then Amor, which means love. And I think that's both in uh, Greek and Roman uh, god. That one crosses the orbit of Mars, but not Earth. Uh, I expect you to know that for like a homework question, but those little memory things that are this minute, I don't think I would uh, test you on that. Definitely not on the final exam. <laughs> so the asteroid composition. So asteroids are actually rock uh, relics of rocky metallic planetesimals. So they were things that had uh, the sun not fired up and blew away all the matter and uh, dust and stuff like that. They may have become actual planets. <laughs> so they were planetesimals, and some of them are still in their planetesimal state. I mean, you could argue, for instance, that Ceres and, and uh, Eros are, are both, you know, rather large. So they, they were very well on their way to becoming planets, but they never got any bigger. So they never got big enough to clear the orbit. So they're now, you know, dwarf planets. But really what happens is these planetesimals get bombarded over and over and over and over again, and they can... Uh, get chondrules in them, in which case they're C-type uh, asteroids, or excuse me, the C-type, they have carbon in them, but there's also the chondrite and, anacond and achondrite. So if they actually go through a melting process, they can actually have certain minerals uh, or metals that will become in the molten state, and they'll actually sphere 
uh, form spheres due to their surface tension. So then when they cool off, you cut open a, a chondrite, not an achondrite, but a chondrite. If you uh, open up a chondrous uh, asteroid, you'll find little spherical, spherules of material inside of them. And you're, you'll see a picture of that in a second. If they don't have a chondri uh, chondrites in them, then they're called achondrites. There's also stony iron meteorites, which are both stone and iron. Then there's iron meteorites, which a lot of people miss. Uh, they're always pitted on the outer surface where they melted coming through our atmosphere, uh, but they're basically iron. So that's kind of neat. There's S-type, which are stony, and there's N-type, which is metally. Okay, uh, and metal type is generally differentiated. So one of the big things between asteroids is whether they're differentiated or not. And what that means is when you cut open a rock, if you find that uh, their densities are in a very distinct order, like one point on the rock has a very dense edge. And as you move away from that in some particular direction, the density of the parts get less and less. That indicates that that used to be part of a bigger body that was molten enough for the most dense things to sink to the center and the least dense things to float to the top. And then you know, of course, that it is uh, uh, differentiated and you know of its origin that way. So that's some of the different types of names that we use for asteroids. Uh, they're, they're, like I said, relics of uh, rocky and metallic planetesimals. They're generally uh, are not large enough to be spherical. Jupiter's tidal disruption kept them from forming a moon-sized planet, and some got hot enough to differentiate. Uh, this formed different asteroid types. The C-type or carbon-type asteroids are not differentiated and are composed of primitive material. You do find carbon, for instance, in there. Uh, differentiated asteroids broke into two types, stony and metal asteroids. The stony S-type asteroids are, high, are the lighter material from the mantle and crust. The metal uh, M-type asteroids are fragments of the iron-nickel-rich core. So you can see if they're in the core, then obviously they're going to be differentiated. Uh, here's sort of the scenario. So you see impact after impact after impact. Uh, the light, then this is broke off into iron and nickel. It's big enough to become molten, so the iron and nickel sinks down to the center. Uh, if you actually get areas around here, then this is areas where some of the liquids were able to form spherules, and then you open it up and you'll find rocks with little uh, spherical shapes inside of it. Uh, they can be further be uh, broken up by running into other stuff and so on and so forth. Uh, by the way, when you're doing these uh, multi-step analysis of uh, photos in your in your textbook. As with all science textbooks, you, should, you normally are expected to spend a good deal of time looking at them, analyzing them, try to go in the order that they give you the little statements. Uh, and, and sometimes it's literally teaching you how to do stuff. In this case, it's not. It's just explaining things. But uh, always take your, your diagrams very seriously when you're in a science classroom, a lot of times they're trying to teach you something that would have been a, a nightmare to teach with uh, just paragraphs. So here's some other uh, things we've actually visited. Uh, this, we're actually looking at the uh, North Pole of this object right now. Uh, this is it as well in two different ones. There's Ida and Dactyl, which I, I told you about Idle, Ida and Dactyl. That's basically an asteroid that has a moon. So here's this uh, sarcophagus looking asteroid and here's this itty bitty moon way over here that's kind of interesting right and i say itty bitty but this sucker is you know 54 kilometers that's you know basically 30 miles that's bigger than uh, most cities so we're talking 30 miles across and uh this little guy is on the order of a, a couple miles across so that that's a, a big deal as well um hemming and hawing because i was trying to find out remind myself what photograph that was. I don't think it's Eris. Is it Eris? Might be Eris. Oh, this is Vesta. That's right. So this is the uh, the asteroid, or actually, uh, yeah, the asteroid of Vesta. And I was trying to look up the, uh, and this is the whole reason I was looking it up, is trying to find out the sizes of it. So Vesta is a small, is a, uh, in 2011, NASA's Dawn spacecraft went into orbit around Vesta. That's the figure in the top left that we're looking at. It's the second most massive body in the asteroid belt. It's, it's only smaller than Cirrus. Uh, Vesta is smaller. Its diameter in this case is 525 kilometers. So we're looking 300 miles across. 
That's that's pretty freaking huge. If that thing hit us, we we would be a bad day. Let's put it that way. Uh, it's smaller than the terrestrial planets, but larger than other visited asteroids. The data from the dawn indicate the vestiges of leftover intact protoplanet that formed within the first two million years of the aggregation of the first solid bodies. So we're thinking instead of 4.5 billion years, maybe it's 4.3 billion years old that it formed. Uh, Ida, on the other hand, I wanted to give you the dimensions on that. And where did it give them to me? I, I see it's talking about Ida, but it is, oh, here it is. So uh, Galileo flew so close to Ida that the probe's cameras could see details as small as 10 meters across. Ida is about 60 kilometers. So from here to here is about 60 kilometers. Again, that's only the order of 40 miles. Uh, and then it's about 25 kilometers, say this way. That's only the order of what, 15 miles. And then it's about 11 kilometers, so say in and out. So, or excuse me, 19 kilometers in and out. So that's an idea of how big it is. And it's kind of cool just to think, yeah, this thing's big, but still you don't think of it as big enough to have a, a moon yet here it does and there's a zoom in of its moon and its little moon has craters too and you see that it's just smaller than a mile in diameter you know even that thing that little dactyl could really wreak havoc on the planet earth uh here's a snowman uh that they talked about uh in your book this is the the snowman uh from oh uh i was looking for the actual name it's the Venenia, Venenia Basin, and this is all stuff on Vesta. We're not seeing it here because here in this case, you, you can sort of see right here, this, this appears to be the snowman, but uh, this part right here may be, I don't think it is, but it may be that part right there. Uh, I don't think so, but it could be. You, you see how that ridge is right there? Let's admit this. You see how that ridge is right there? That's the thing that's making me say that's probably the same structure uh, as this one. Uh, what makes me less confident is I sort of see a ridge here, but maybe not. But either ways, these are basins that were uh, created by impacts. Uh, they estimate this uh, basin to be about 1 billion years old, and the Veninia uh, basin uh, is estimated to be about 2 billion years old. So anyways, that's some of the cool stuff you can see on asteroids. Obviously, they, they have pot marks on them, just like uh, planets would, uh, especially the bigger ones. The smaller ones don't necessarily, I mean, they'll still have pits on it, but they won't have huge pits because basically once you get a certain fraction of the size of the object, so if you hit this with something maybe a third or a half the size, it's just going to break in pieces. Uh, so that's why you don't generally see uh, huge fractions. This one obviously is a big deal because obviously that thing is uh, on the order of a third or more uh, the crater size. So the crater is about a third or more the 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 object size. So that means it's just been hit by something really really big, and the fact that it stayed together is pretty remarkable. The comments, like I said, are icy planetesimals formed from the primordial material. They would have been further out because remember, in order for the icy materials to take part in planet making, they have to be uh, condensed, at least in the liquid state, preferably in the uh, solid state, but at least in the liquid state because the gaseous state is too energetic to generally let gravity pull it together. Uh, they are small icy bodies uh, when far from the sun, when they uh, come into the inner area, they can actually become liquid and they can even sublimate and give off gases, stuff of that sort. The comets are located in the Kuiper belt and or the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud also has asteroids because the Oort cloud is just uh, suggested by Jan Oort specifically because we know that uh, objects come near Oort orb uh, orbits all the time. That would mean objects probably come in near Jupiter orbits all the time and near Saturn orbits all the time. So every time something fairly small comes near the big planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, but especially Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, then uh, they're going to have an interaction with that planet gravitationally, and that, that planet is going to slingshot it out in random directions. So over time, Jan Oort suspected there would be a, a sphere centered on our sun 
where things are orbiting in these crazy orbits where their semi-major axis is really, really super long, but their semi-minor axis or their minor axis and major axis are really vastly different. So there'll be elliptical orbits. Uh, the outer part would be really, really far away. The inner part might actually come within our inner solar system or even, uh, even closer than Earth. Uh, but that's what the Oort cloud is. So because it was made that way, you're just as likely to have asteroids as you are comets out there. Here's some short period comets. And remember, as far as your book goes, short period means less than 200 years. Things that are 200 years or longer are called long period comets. So uh, you see in here uh, Haley, which we do not think of normally as a short period comet because it takes like 76 years or whatever, is a short period comet because it's less than 200. But it comes from really far out and then orbits comes around uh, the inner planets, if you will, and then goes back out. Uh, here's Jupiter way out here. Here's Mars, Earth, Mer uh, Venus, and Mercury. So you can see uh, Halley actually comes in in between the orbit of Venus and, and Mercury there. There's Inky. Uh, and then there's a couple other objects that are orbiting this way and that. So all these different things are different uh, short period comets. And notice they're not inclined, not necessarily inclined to stay in the plane. You can see they're actually, if you're looking at the edge on of this diagram, uh, you're seeing this is the orbital plane of the Earth and the solar system roughly. Remember, it's within a couple of degrees. Uh, but these comets are actually in quite... Uh, elevated orbits. So Haley, for instance, is the most elevated, actually other than this green guy who they didn't name. But anyways, that's uh, that's some of the short period comets. They're currently around 400 known. Uh, they originate in the Kuiper Belt. And then the long period comets are uh, greater than 200 years to perhaps 1 million years. Uh, they're prograde or retrograde orbits, uh, and they're from the Oort cloud. They have large tilts from the ecliptic. They're very elongated or orbits and the nucleus is not worn out. And there's about 3000 of them known. So what do we mean by the nucleus not worn out? Well, each time this object comes into the inner solar system, they get pelted by the radiation of the sun. And then that causes some parts to bake off and, and so on and so forth. So you end up getting these pits and stuff uh, basically in it, as well as uh, just losing a lot of material. Well, if your orbit's on the order of a million years uh, and it, you've been around for, let's say, 4.5 billion, then you've only been around a few thousand times, right? Whereas these other things have been around uh, that have 200 year orbits, they get the crap kicked out of them because they've been uh, hundreds of thousands and, and even millions of times around. The large tilts are from the ecliptic, or that, of course, is like through the randomness of the Oort cloud. Uh, and like I said, there's about 3,000 of them known. It doesn't really show any names on here, but that's some of the long period comets. Now, if you look here, this is, uh, if I remember correctly, this is built, let me double check. Uh, this is a comet and you can see it looks like a snowball. Yeah, this is a uh, comet built too. So it, it's spelled wild, W-I-L-D, but it's built because uh, it's like German. So we actually took a, a Stardust spacecraft and flew so close to it that we got to see this. That's pretty amazing. We got in its tail and all sorts of cool stuff. And uh, the comet nucleus is ice and dust mix. The comets are often described as dirty snowballs. That sort of looks the part right here. You know, it looks like some of that junk that's hanging under your wheel well after you've been driving in Michigan in the middle of the winter for a couple of weeks. Uh, so the size of the nucleus ranges from a few dozen meters to several hundred kilometers. Obviously, we're talking uh, really serious stuff there. And the figure shows the comet's appearance when far from the sun. So this is us, uh, our spacecraft following it really far away from the sun. And we got these cool pictures. Uh, we've done that before. We've also had the surface of a, a comet uh, just before something hits it. Uh, we've used that. We've even used uh, spacecraft to hit things before and then we look at it with spectroscopy and that allows us to see the elements present and compounds that are present so on and so forth. Sometimes we just wait for collisions to occur and then we watch the collisions and use spectroscopy to find out what things are made of. So that's kind of cool. So here's the anatomy of a comet. The comet has a, a head and the head is sort of the front part. So the part that's actually moving 
uh, the direction it's moving. Now, when you look at the tail, this reeks from cartoon. This reeks like something clearly moving this way, and maybe it's got some hair moving this way. But in fact, the tail doesn't indicate what direction uh, it's traveling, even though it looks like it from everything we've seen in cartoons. The ion tail, which is a straight one, uh, if you draw a line straight back, would point straight through the middle of the comet's nucleus, which you see here. And then, of course, you have the coma out here and the atmosphere out here. Uh, that would point directly back to the center of the sun. So it really points to the sun. Now, the comet tail uh, or the dust tail is actually where that stuff I told you about was being baked off from the actual nucleus. And then it's gas and dust and stuff like that. So it has to obey the laws of Newtonian, or excuse me, of Kepler, uh, which says that, you know, when you go farther out, the orbits are actually bigger and slower. So the objects actually go slower. So these are objects actually sinking out from our orbit and slowing down as a result of conservation of, of momentum, basically, conservation of angular momentum. So that's why the dust tail curves. And the dust tail, uh, is basically, like I said, just melted gas and dust that came from the, the head, whereas the ion tail is actually ions, where radiation has ionized various atoms, uh, and that radiation, of course, came from the sun. The sun heats the icy nucleus, causing sublimation. Uh, because of the very, very low pressures out there, it's not always the big deal that you go straight from liquid, uh, or excuse me, from solid to liquid. You can actually go from solid to gas and that's sublimating. That's what uh, dry ice does. And dry ice, of course, is carbon dioxide. But other things do it if you're in these conditions where there's literally no atmosphere. So you don't have enough pressure to hold it into the liquid state. So it just automatically goes straight to the gaseous state. The sublimation forms several uh, comet parts. Like I said, the, the coma, which is the atmospheric halo around the nucleus, the ion tail, that's the ions that's swept away by the solar wind, and the dust tail that is swept away. Comets have two tails. Like I said, an ion tail is created by the solar wind interacting with ions of the nucleus, and a dust tail is created by solar wind and sunlight, and the comet tails point away from the sun. So like I said, if you followed from here to here, it would point right to the center of the sun, uh, that means it actually is being blown away. So you can see maybe the dust tail a little bit shows you which direction it's coming from, but it's not straight like this way. It's actually sort of parallel to what the tail is trying to become. So these tails, the dust tail and the ion tail are mainly just inner, uh, inner solar system phenomena. So when they get on the order of a couple astronomical units away, that's when the tails show up. Otherwise you wouldn't see them illuminated at all. In fact, they would show up in the infrared because they're quite cold. About a dozen spacecraft have been sent to rendezvous with comets. One recent was Rosetta. Uh, a projectile from deep impact hit Comet Temple 1 in order to study its comets, uh, its contents. So here's the impact site. We just said, I'm going to shoot that thing because, you know, that's what we do. <laughs> and with that, we were able to actually make out from spectroscopy what actually elements and compounds were in it. Uh, when we run through, for instance, meteor showers, what we're doing is we're running through uh, gas and dust and particles, ice, all sorts of stuff that was left from previous asteroids. So as the asteroids are, or excuse me, I should say comets, really, as the comets come through the inner solar system, they cross numerous orbits of planets. And that dust tail and ion tail, of course, the ion tail gets blown out, but the dust tail is sort of left behind on its own orbit. If that's left behind in, say, the orbit of the Earth, then when the Earth goes through it, we'll actually see streaks of meteors. Remember, meteors are just the streaks of light. We'll see meteors going through it, and that's a meteor shower. Uh, the constellation from which it appears, uh, all the things are radiating. See how all these look like they're going back to a common point here? Uh, that's uh, where we get the name of the actual meteor shower. So uh, in this case, whatever constellation this is, it looked like Sagittarius for a second. Now it doesn't look like Sagittarius at all. Uh, that could be this. That's not Leo. Is it? No, that's not Leo. This part right here made me think it was Sagittarius, that and that, but that's not it. Uh, Perseus. That could be Perseus, but it's missing a couple stars. Anyways, if this constellation were Perseid, we'd call it a Perseid meteor shower. If it was Leo, we'd call it the uh, 
Leonid meteor shower and so on and so forth. But we're just running through debris that the comet left when coming into our inner solar system. So that's what the meteor showers are for are from. Meteors from comets are less than a centimeter across and have a density of cigarette ash. That's sort of what they're what they're like is they're the flakiness of cigarette ash and the ones that uh, make the huge fireballs that go across the sky that you see blues and reds and stuff baking off. Not not like the one in, in, in Russia recently, by the way, uh, but the smaller ones that you see every now and then I've saw I've seen maybe three in my life. Uh, those are normally no bigger than, say, a marble or a really big piece of cigarette ash. I'm, I'm reminded of uh, Christmas vacation and basically the wife's mother uh, at the <laughs> at the bar uh, while they're cooking breakfast with a cigarette and a long ash hanging off of it like that. Uh, that's sort of the biggest case scenario of, of those fireballs. Uh, now, things that are bigger than on the order of a meter across, then they tend to actually make it to the surface of the earth, and they are quite a show, as you'll see in a few. Uh, single pieces of debris uh, result in sporadic meteor showers as well. Uh, meteorites, by the way, we actually find them. Uh, sometimes things come from Earth, end up on Mars. Sometimes things come from other uh, moons and other planets and end up on Mars or Earth. In this case, meteorites are pieces of asteroids that have fallen to Earth. In space, a meteorite is called a meteoroid. And while passing through the atmosphere, it's just called a meteor. So here's uh, some pretty cool pictures. This actually, I think, is melted uh, iron is what it looks like to me. Uh, but it stands out in the Martian surface, whereas on Earth, uh, a rock like this, even a, a small one, wouldn't necessarily show up around a pile of rocks, right? But on the surface of Mars, it stands out quite differently. So here's the chondrules I was telling you about. Uh, see how they're sort of spherical in shape, and that's literally because they were molten and probably released a little gas, which gave them a little buffer for them to form the shape that they uh, wanted to, which is mostly spherical. Meteorites are pieces of asteroids. They're over 90% are stony, like earth rocks. Chondrites are stony meteorites with chondrules in it, and achondrites are stony meteorites without chondrules. And then carbonaceous chondrites are, chondri are chondrites that are rich in carbon. So obvious names. I don't think that'll be much for you to remember for tests. Uh, here's a iron uh, nickel molten thing. You can see the actual meltedness around here. Now here's where they've sort of ablated it to make, so you can see the actual uh, inside. And the iron meteorites have high concentrations of metal with a melted and pitted appearance. That's the melted and pitted appearance. And stony iron meteorites are a combination and are relatively rare. So here you see irons and minerals in it. So the stony materials is stuff between. The shiny materials would be the iron uh, and nickel and stuff like that. So some of the dust and stuff that's left by uh, comets and all that stuff uh, is left, obviously, in our ecliptic, which is basically the path that it looks like our sun follows. And because of that, every now and then you'll get zodiacal dust. And what that means is as the sun goes down, it uh, basically diffracts off of the various particles in uh, the outer space and causes a light that stands up over the horizon after sunset. That's called zodiacal uh, light. Uh, and it's caused by the zodiacal dust. And again, the ecliptic is along the constellations of the zodiac. That's why they became popular to begin with. So it's only natural that you'd expect that dust to be along the zodiac as well. Large collisions in space are not frequent, but they do occur. I remember this one. I, we actually knew it was going to happen. Uh, I was an undergraduate at East Carolina at the time, and we had our telescope set up. So we actually watched it every day that the weather was clear. And we could see, you know, Jupiter looking beautiful for several days before it. And then after it, it had these huge black spots, and they lasted for uh, several days. Uh, that was kind of neat, it, but it was a comet shoemaker Levy 9 and it crashed into Jupiter. Uh, you probably remember this one. Uh, this was in Russia back in 2013, the Shelyabinsk, Russia. So uh, evidently Russia had a, a real problem with a lot of fraud. Specifically, people would like walk out in front of cars and get hit on purpose uh, and then sue you. So it's very common for virtually everybody in Russia that owns a car to have a dash cam. So luckily, because of that, you know, misbehavior of citizens and poor folk or whatever, 
uh, we were fortunate enough to have numerous, numerous videos of this, but what happened is in 2013, this giant rock and parts of it was, you know, it was obviously even larger when it happened, but it came through and exploded in the upper atmosphere of earth and in fact shattered windows injured people stuff like that uh this has happened uh before uh they were able to find this at the bottom of a frozen lake other bits and pieces were found about they can trace back the path uh using knowledge of astronomy people could build the original orbit and it appears that this thing was in an orbit that had recently ran into another bigger object that was on the order of uh several kilometers across i think two or three kilometers across and it broke off of that so that's how we ended up getting hit by it. In 1908, there was a uh, the Tunguska event. If you ever watch the old X-Files, they always talked about Tunguska. Uh, that was a weird thing. Imagine being uh, Tunguska, uh, which is uh, that Siberian area of Russia. Imagine you're asleep at night and you hear and feel an explosion like worse than any earthquake you ever felt and you go outside and all of a sudden you see the whole forest is leveled and fire and dust and all sorts of crap that's really what happened uh it didn't leave an appreciable crater uh, so we know it actually exploded above the earth's surface it didn't leave much in terms of debris so we're pretty confident it was a comet but it was huge and it, it leveled trees for hundreds of thousands of acres if i remember correctly so that was a really big deal uh, obviously, these things are potentially life threatening for everything, so we try to watch them. Uh, and that's basically it. The rest of this is math stuff. Here's the one thing that's kind of interesting this 4.2 uh, times 10 to the 15th joules. That's the, uh, if you actually want to take out the mega, it would be 10 to the 9th, 4.2 uh, times 10 to the 9th tons of uh, explosives, basically, is the energy that a, a single explosive like TNT or something like that would do. Uh, this 4.2 times 10 to the 15th is the energy of a megaton hydrogen bomb. And a megaton, remember the actual uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Fat Man and Little Boy, those bombs were on the order of kilotons, not megatons, okay? In fact, uh, a megaton bomb is about 67 times stronger than the horrible bomb we dropped on Hiroshima. So when you actually calculate uh, a 10 kilometer comet nucleus traveling at five or excuse me at 20 kilometers per second and, and basically that's roughly what you find things orbiting at is around 20 kilometers per second. You can actually imagine them going up to the escape velocity of the planet that they're going to hit because obviously uh, that's how much velocity it would get if it came infinitely far away and reached the earth it would actually reach the earth's escape velocity and that would be the velocity that it travels at. So when you do kinetic energy, which is one half mv squared, when you do that calculation of it, you find that it's one times 10 to the 23 joules. If you compare that to a one megaton hydrogen bomb, you'd find out that in fact, it's 24 times 10 to the six. So 24 million one megaton bombs uh, is the equivalent of this 10 uh, kilometer diameter nucleus. Uh, comet nucleus. So that's kind of interesting. These are not the calculations. Uh, you know, I don't require these calculations, but uh, one, knowing that energy value, the 4.2 times in the 15th joules per megaton is pretty helpful in comparing how bad a, uh, or how much energy something has and using one half mv squared is just an estimate. It's not it's not that this thing is like a nuclear weapon. You know, a nuclear weapon causes a mass explosion, it causes fire, but it also releases uh, a buttload of radioactive material because it was literally made of radioactive material. So that's a whole nother thing. And it does provide radiation. Well, this would provide radiation as well, but a lot less of the radioactive material because it's not necessarily filled with radioactive material. Its core that made it happen is not radioactive material. It has probably just about as much radioactive material as say the earth does. Uh, but the energy is so high that it really does a lot of damage. It digs a deep hole, it melts the surface of the earth when it hits it, it uh, causes it literally to be molten for, you know, split seconds. And then it comes back, generally speaking, the hole made by a comet or asteroid is about 10 times the diameter of the asteroid wide. And it's about uh, two to 10 times as deep. Okay, usually five is roughly the ballpark figure. So a one kilometer asteroid would make a 10 kilometer wide 
a dimple and anywhere from two kilometers to five or even 10 kilometers deep. So that can give you an idea of how much energy it is because literally it's busting out part of that. Some of that stuff's uh, becoming liquid and so on and so forth. So anyways, we've finished this chapter. Does anyone have any questions on anything? Okay, well, we have lab today and I'm gonna tell you briefly what's going on with lab. Uh, and you guys can meet me if you so desire. I'm not taking role, uh, but I will post a formal lab write up. I'm just gonna tell you what we're gonna do uh, since we've got a little bit of time. Uh, I'm going to first off go to, let's go to heavensabove.com. Now, I would ideally want you to use uh, Starry Night if you have that software. You, you know, if you bought the package that you were supposed to buy, it came with this Starry Night workbook. Okay. That says Starry Night workbook like this. Again, looking in the itty bitty window, that's me. Okay. Uh, that also gave you inside a place to go and a code to download Starry Night Student Edition. And uh, that's, that's what I really would prefer to use. So if you have that, make sure you use it. If you don't have that, uh, you can uh, use another version that you have. Maybe you have the Sky. Maybe you have Sky Safari. Maybe you have uh, Redshift or one of those other software packages, Voyager, Stargazer is another one. Any of those that you have would be better than Heavens Above, but Heavens Above is not bad in a pickle. So let me show you what we're going to do. I'm going to do www.heavens-above.com. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Okay, so yes, we went to heavensabove.com. Now we're going to scroll down to interactive sky chart. Okay, now when you do this, you need to make sure you put your right ascension, to, or excuse me, your longitude and latitude of your location. Uh, this is roughly the latitude that I'm using because it's, you know, 36 north and 76 uh, west. That's actually close enough for yourself. So if you want to take a screenshot, that's the longitude and latitude you can use. Uh, all you have to do to click uh, to change it is click up here and it'll give you like a map. You can click off a place on Earth and then it'll just give you a longitude and latitude for that. You can click in an address. It'll give you a longitude and latitude. All that stuff's fair game. Of course, we've used this before, so it shouldn't be uh, that new to you guys. But either way, you've got to go here if you don't have one of the software packages. If you do have the software package, I would rather you use that and I'd make sure you put the location as your location. And what I want you to do is turn the hour to, uh, let's see if it does 24. And let's see. And somehow I managed to make that uh, do the printout version. So this is 12 and this, this is zero. And let's say update. So that's clearly noon. Let's see if it does 24. So it's not doing that. Uh, let's do 2359. There you go. Now you see the sun's not out. So this is what I want you to do. You're probably going to have to go to 2359. That's close enough. You're looking for midnight, basically. And at midnight, uh, the constellation that is due south of you, which notice due north is right here, due uh, west is right here, due east is right here, due south is along this vertical line going straight through south, going right through the middle of the circle. So what your job is, is your job is to find at midnight not only which constellation of the zodiac is uh, due south of us, but what part of it. So specifically, I want you to do this for, let's say, the first of every month. So let's play April 1, 2359, update. Now, you can start at April 1, then you're going to do uh, 
May 1, then you're going to do June 1, then you're going to do July 1, all the way back until you get to April 1 again. And you're going to uh, not only figure out what constellation of the zodiac was uh, due south of you, but roughly what part. So what I would suggest you do is draw the drawing for the constellation and then show approximately where the line due south is going through. So like right here for this one might be a good idea. And then you just put Leo, draw the drawings and show the line and then do again for May 1st. Update. And now you can see due south obviously is the constellation Virgo. This is not the drawing I normally like of Virgo. You might want to look for a different one. But you can see basically maybe this star is almost due south. If you look at it, uh, let's see if it actually gives you azimuth. And it gives an azimuth of 180.1. So when you hover over a star, if that star says exactly 180, you know it's due north. I mean, excuse me, exactly due south of you. Uh, so that's pretty close. What we want is probably from 170 degrees to 190 degrees. Uh, all that will be close enough. And then you'd want a major star within the constellation, like Spica is a really bright one. The ones that have the lines connecting them are usually the brightest stars. So you can, again, draw the actual diagram and choose whatever Virgo uh, diagram you want. But the main thing is uh, put what part of the constellation is due south of you. When you're finished with all that, you'll have basically 12 of them. And by the way, you might have to include Ophiuchus, O-P-H-I-U-C-H-U-S, because uh, Ophiuchus is actually along the ecliptic as well, uh, but it wasn't part of the original uh, 13, or excuse me, original 12 zodiacal constellations. So it's okay to use Ophiuchus if you need to. Here's Cancer. You can see Cancer is not even that prominent of a constellation to begin with. It's this triangle and it's also this triangle. Uh, but again, you're going to try to look online, find really good uh, drawings, stick figures of the zodiacal constellations. And then you're going to choose the stick figures you like. Uh, and you're going to make sort of a circle. So if you take Microsoft Word and you put a big circle uh, as large in the paper as possible, then you can put the constellations in order from, let's say, the top would be May 1 and then April 1 and then so on and so forth. And what you're trying to do is make that distance around that circle, which is 360 degrees, that's going to be 365 days, right? So... You, that's going to be divvied up over 12, uh, maybe 13 constellations all the way around. So you divide 360 degrees by the number of constellations you have and try to make take a, into account the fact that, say, uh, Virgo is way bigger than Libra and let it take a little bit more angles. But what you want to do is then put another circle inside of that circle where you put the individual dates, uh, May 1, uh, June 1, July 1, all the way around. And by knowing that the constellation is due south of you, then you can look across that circle, across the sun, and see that the sun is in the opposite constellation. So that's really what you're trying to do, is make a figure like the figure in chapter, I think it was chapter two, let me find out what figure it is. You're going to basically remake that figure, and that's probably the easiest way to explain it. And you're going to make it by doing your own researchification specifically your researchification into the positions of the constellations at midnight on the first of each month. So the diagram I'm looking for, there it is. It's diagram two, figure 213 on page 34 of your textbook. That's what you're trying to make, something like that. It doesn't have to be as beautiful as that, of course. It, it could be. Uh, and maybe if it turns out really, really wonderful, I might actually give you some uh, astro points for doing above and beyond what the lab requires so you're welcome to do that but that really is what we're trying to make is a diagram like this so let me stop sharing and show you the, the full picture again so remember this picture that has uh that's the, yeah that's the diagram we did we saw earlier this year exactly what i want you guys to do is be able to make that diagram uh and I've given you the way to do it. I just told you how to do it. All you gotta do is go to the first of each month and do that. Uh, some people might actually choose the 
uh, middle of the month, and that would be fine as well, but just choose one. Choose the middle of the month or the beginning of the month, the first of the month or the 15th of the month, either way, and do that. If you want to be really precise, maybe you do the first and the 15th of every month. Again, that runs into the area where you're going to get some astro points added as opposed to just uh, the lab. So uh, make it as fancy as you want. Then when you're done, you'll have a orbit of the Earth around the sun. You put the sun as the middle of the circle. You put the orbit of the Earth around it. You know that the orbit of the Earth goes from, say, here to here every 365 days or in one year. So you can slowly put that out and then use that diagram like we did in Chapter 2 to predict, you know, what would be on the horizon at, five, uh, at sunset on September you know, first or something like that. We can do all that with that diagram, but that's what you're doing for lab. I will re-explain that at one for people that aren't here or for people that maybe have me for lab and not for lecture, uh, but you're not required to come. If you do, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine too. You can use it again as a chance to ask me questions, but other than that, just see me at 1.30. Yeah, we're Tuesday. Yeah, so 1.30 uh, for lab, uh, but again, you're not required and you're now free to go, uh, but I'll wait for the last person to leave in case anybody has questions. Sorry it took so long to let you in, Amy. I, I didn't realize it was holding you outside. I thought it had said you were in, but uh, you and three other people, I think. See ya. Have a very nice day. Thank you, Matthew. Have a good one. Amanda, Amy, Jamie. Make I it. actually make it to lab today is there mm -hmm. anything that i need to do no uh did just what i just mentioned to you guys the uh, lab will actually be posted in week 12 uh on the lab portion of canvas and it'll have a, a word document that you can download that's the instructions you just complete that and turn that in uh within you know by the next lab meeting and you're done for the lab okay all okay. right thank you no problem Anybody else? Mason, Jamie, or Amy, y'all have any questions or y'all not there? I see Mason's having some connection problems. All right, well, I'll call it a day. I hope you all, all have a great one. Uh, have a great weekend. I will see you again Tuesday. Uh, don't forget to start doing your practice tests. Have a good day. <laughs>